This video contains spoilers. Your father never had the makings of a varsity athlete. Is that on the table, Daddy's Navy picture? You ever miss him? When he was in prison? Or since he's been dead? I don't know shit about The Sopranos. Last Friday, on the relatively new streaming app service known as HBO Max, Sopranos fans were treated to the long-awaited prequel movie, The Many Saints of Newark. Turns out Feech's card game wasn't in the cards. Nary a mention of Feech at all. Perhaps the next prequel. The movie gives us a small glimpse into the formative years of Tony Soprano before he had transformed into a criminal scumbag. One of the biggest revelations, something many fans long suspected, was that Tony lied to Christopher regarding how his father died, which is a vintage Tony trait of telling half-truths. Otherwise, the movie doesn't spend too much time on Tony himself. He appears as a child, and we get to see his father's arrest at the fair that was covered in the show from Tony's angle. We learn that he tested high for intelligence and that he had a rebellious streak from a young age, running numbers at school and stealing an ice cream truck to distribute tasty treats to children. As a high school student, it's also clear he was serious about football, college, and not becoming a mobster, or at least as serious as high school students can be. We see his manipulative, domineering mother played perfectly by Vera Farmiga. Otherwise, The Many Saints of Newark isn't about Tony at all, despite the teases in the trailer. Instead, the movie is really about Newark itself, weaving an ensemble cast around the changing power dynamics with the rise of black power in the late 1960s and the reluctant decline of the influence and prestige of the mafia. This is no golden age. Tony and his crew's various recollections of how great things were back then are revealed as more legend than fact. It is in this simmer stew that Tony slowly boils from child to teenager and ultimately to mobster. The atmosphere is so pervasive. David Chase and his co-screenwriter Lawrence Connor make it clear there is no escape. The roots of Tony's path to becoming a monster begin in his family life but don't end there. He's aware of the criminal dealings of his father and uncle. In his formative years, his father goes to prison after the arrest at the fair, leaving his mother to struggle with the stress levied on her by all that comes with this life. We also get a glimpse of the roots of Tony's depression and mental health issues. His mother, Olivia, was persuaded to take medication, but she didn't want it. It makes you wonder if Olivia could have been properly medicated had she been born 30 years later. At the same time, the impact of Johnny's ways on Livia is more profound here than previously implied, as is her desire to turn to her son for comfort in Johnny Boy's absence. It also perhaps explains Tony's inclination towards compulsive eating, when we see her bond with Tony while serving him food, and then stressing him out and causing a big scene before he even properly digs in. In his father's absence, Tony takes a strong liking to Uncle Dickie, and most of the story revolves around him. In some ways, Dickie can be seen as a mirror of Tony, as if Tony from the late 90s and early 2000s was transported back to the 1960s and 70s. Like Tony himself, Dickie struggles with his criminal endeavors, often wondering what things might be like had he not been born into it. He also has a short temper and is inclined towards violence. But Dickie is conflicted at times. He isn't cruel or sadistic like Richie April or crazy like Ralph Cifaretto. At the same time, Dickie has a jealous streak, just like Tony, and a temper as well, one that can explode into violence. In fits of rage, he murders his own father and also his former stepmother turned Guma. Also like Tony, he enjoys the perks and rewards that come with a criminal lifestyle, yet he is conflicted over whether he should encourage or discourage his nephew from the life. This has been a common theme throughout the series. Tony and Carmela's children, as well as the offspring of most of Tony's crew, they get swept up in the criminal life, unable to escape the pull. 
There's a statement here about how evil begets evil, and crimes of the fathers creating sin in the offspring. In the many saints of Newark, there is evil in the environment itself. Dickie isn't the only criminal in the city. At times, it seems like everyone is, as Newark descends into riots and the city itself leeches into Tony. You could say that Tony carries this with him. Even as he moves to a fancy home in the suburbs, there is no escape. In that sense, part of the genius in the movie is how certain themes and character traits transcend the generations. The movie could easily be a Sopranos episode, where you take the exact same dialogue, assign it to characters from the next generation, and it really wouldn't make a world of difference. The characters are what they are, perhaps because of where they're from, the families they group in, and the people that surround them. Chase doesn't make it easy to separate one primary cause from the other. Like life itself, it's all of the above. About the only thing you can do is romanticize it and rationalize it. And so we see more than enough to know that Tony has a habit of romanticizing the past to an extreme, where he remembered things the way he wanted to remember them, while blocking out things that he didn't. Kind of like Dickie, who wanted to do good deeds in part as an act of contrition for the heinous ones, such as murdering his father or drowning his guma for sleeping with Harold. In some ways, Harold is the most intriguing new character in the movie, and I hate to say it, but if there's one area where the movie suffers, it's in trying to cram too much stuff into a short running time. Thus, we only get glimpses of Harold. He can be seen as a black Dickie. He's smart, up-and-coming, ruthless, and liked by the ladies, even Dickie's guma. He once worked for Dickie, but as the riots progress, he feels more empowered and wants everything for himself. He ultimately places a hit on Dickie, though one that fails. Dickie's relationship with Harold should have had more screen time. It's interesting to think what else happened between them and the love triangle. But this isn't Dickie's story alone, however. In many ways, it's also Junior's, and how his own seething jealousy pervaded things big and small. The movie reconfirms that Uncle June never had the makings of a varsity athlete. Junior was in Johnny Boy's shadow, the number two brother, and it's pretty clear he didn't like it. Not his position, or the shit he has to eat. Again, we see this in matters big and small. When Johnny is ultimately released from prison, does he thank Junior for filling in during his absence? No, he does not. Oof, maron. Instead, Johnny berated his older brother, pestering him for not stepping up. Junior failed to step up, once again illustrating the fact that he was never a natural-born leader. Far from it. He was always outside the real action and wanted in. Take the token scene we got when Johnny Boy put a bullet through Livia's beehive hairdo. According to the story as told by Janice, Uncle Junior and his gumad were in the car when it happened. But when we see it happen for real in The Many Saints of Newark, it is instead Dickie and Joanne in the backseat. Perhaps Junior inserted himself into it, making him a part of the legend and erasing Dickie from it. This brings us to the biggest reveal in the movie and yet another parallel between Tony and Dickie. It's long been suspected that Tony lied to Christopher about the death of his father, claiming it was a rival mobster that used a dirty cop. We now learn that Uncle Junior himself ordered the hit, the same as he would later do to Tony. In that sense, history both repeats itself in an unbreakable cycle, and yet Junior can also be seen as a fulcrum of major events, putting the cycle into motion even as he's tied to it. Killing Dickie leaves Chrissy fatherless and binds him to Tony, leading ultimately to his own death at Tony's hands. At the same time, the movie isn't precisely clear on why Junior puts the hit on Dickie, Dickie was certainly spiraling out of control, killing his own father and murdering his mistress, engaged in a war with Harold, who once worked for him and also slept with his gumat. 
There's an argument to be made that Dickie had to go like we've seen so many times on the show. Still, Chase makes it clear that Junior can't handle personal slights, and his character remained true to form by being obsessed with how he is perceived by others. This point was best illustrated in the series when it came to orally pleasing his lady friend Bobby. Junior wanted that information kept secret, because if it was ever revealed, it would be perceived as a sign of weakness, perhaps even suggesting that Junior was a fanook. We saw the same impulse here after he was mocked by Dickie following his fall on the steps. Junior resented Dickie personally to the fullest. And the fact his ungrateful kid brother lambasted him when he was released from the can was the highest insult. In his mind, Junior is the one who should have been providing support for Livia. And Junior is the one to whom Tony should have been looking up to. Not that punk Dickie Moltisante. So Junior was the one who ultimately had Dickie killed, and while Junior never had the makings of a varsity athlete, he did exhibit tremendous prowess when it comes to the art of criminal innovation. While hiding safely deep behind the scenes, Junior proved to be sneakily effective, taking out a member of the family and keeping it hidden. I said earlier that Tony lied to Chrissy, but Tony probably didn't know the truth himself. Junior must have lied to him. This certainly makes you wonder what other deep cover hits may have been the product of Uncle June's insecurities when it came to how he was perceived by others, particularly when it comes to his kid brother's family. This likewise rings back to when Junior found himself under the spell of Livia's manipulations, back when she convinced Junior to have Tony whacked. Knowing Junior's past feelings with his desire to step up in Johnny's absence, Junior's desire to prove himself on that front still lingered in his mind, making him easy prey for Livia's masterful manipulations. Again, the motivations remain murky and unclear as they should be. You could say Junior was manipulated by Livia, but now that we've seen Junior's jealousy laid bare and what he was willing to do about it, was he manipulating her? Clearly, he was jealous of Tony for rising so fast in the family and running the show when Junior felt it should be him and him alone. The sample impulse that caused Junior to whack Dickie would have caused him to whack Tony. Dickie's death ultimately inspires Tony to go all in on a life of crime, when prior to that moment, he seemed determined to head in the other direction. It is ironic that by inspiring and leading Tony into a life of crime, this eventually leads to his own son's future demise. Ultimately, however you interpret the movie, Chase gives no easy answers. Indeed, he makes that point clear from the very beginning, when Christopher Moltisanti himself narrates from beyond the grave. Whether it's a red herring or not, there's also a moment when young Tony holds baby Chrissy, crying uncontrollably at the mere sight of him, as if he knows what is to come. Some babies, when they come into the world, know all kinds of things from the other side. In the series, Paulie sees a psychic, Christopher thinks he went to hell when he delivers a message pertaining to 3 o'clock, Tony has premonitions and dreams, and a near-death experience. It's impossible to interpret this in the context of a character-driven story, but it opens the possibility, however far-fetched, that we're moved by forces outside of our living experience. Newark might be where they lived and where the story starts, but everything is connected in a world beyond the physical. At the end of the day, the only thing that disappointed me was the disturbing lack of Gabagool. Oof, Marone. David Chase, as a punishment, no more Gabagool for you. I for one enjoyed The Many Saints of Newark, and I hope we get more Sopranos Universe material from David Chase. So what did you think of The Many Saints of Newark? Please share your thoughts in the comments section. Thanks for watching, everyone. I hope you enjoyed, and have a wonderful night. Did the hit for Jilly Ruffalo. Jilly and your old man were in the can together. Jilly stabbed your old man's salt mate to death. You remember Dickie Moltisanti? Must be a restaurant around no. Somewhere. No?
Is he a friend of yours? He was my father. They hit my dad right outside my house, right? He's bringing home a crib for me? You're being set up! He's lying to you, whoever he is. Well, no, he, uh... It's outside the house, but he, he wasn't carrying a crib. He had a bunch of TV trays. Could have been a crib just as easily. This is how you leave me? When I'm almost burned to death cooking you a fucking snack? Come on, huh? you could have just as easily been making yourself something to eat. Yeah. It's done. Three of my capos have their mothers in this place? Instead of living in normal homes? This must be some kind of fucking end move. What do they think, I'm stupid? Let me go talk to him. I promised Johnny I'd take care of Tony while he was in jail. The way you talk, you just confuse him. He only listens to Dickie. Look at Dickie Moltisanti. His father gets whacked, he steps up. Takes care of his family, takes care of all the business. Not a peep out of him. He's younger than you. If this is true, Livia, you know what I... I mean... I'm the boss, for Christ's sake. If, if, if I don't act, blood or no... You got any wine? Gatsa, the malanga. Where's that fucking man to go? It's gone. Half a fucking tray in there. I was hungry. Son of a bitch. No. Perché me voglio gore mi? Dormiende cadari. Core, core in grade. Stay down. Don't move. Uncle June, I just said don't move. 